Coming up on Market to Market. Domestic oil production is booming, fueling tragic railroad accidents and a shortage of cars to move agricultural commodities. And an innovative cattle operation in the Midwest traces its genetic progeny to the vast majority of America's best bulls. Those stories and market analysis with Alan Brugler, next. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com. And by Sookup Manufacturing Company. Offering a full line of grain drying and storage equipment and steel buildings, Sookup Manufacturing is on a mission to protect and preserve your crop and the tools that produce it. This is the Friday, June 27 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Mike Pearson. Public and private reports this week revealed a mixed bag of economic developments. First, the good news. The Commerce Department reports new home sales jumped 18.6% last month to their highest level since May of 2008. Sales in the far larger existing home market jumped nearly 5% in May, marking their largest single-month gain in nearly three years. But don't break out the champagne just yet. Despite a solid four-tenths of a percent gain in personal income last month, consumer spending, which accounts for nearly 70% of all economic activity, rose a paltry two-tenths of a percent in May. But one place consumers are spending more is at the pump. And motorists will likely encounter the highest gasoline prices for Independence Day travel in six years. The pinch at the pump is somewhat perplexing given the surge in domestic oil production. But the boom also has fueled tragic railroad accidents. This week, authorities were given a snapshot of the massive amount of crude riding America's rails. State and federal officials are finally getting data on exactly how many shipments of crude oil are rolling along America's railways. The Associated Press obtained details of the shipments filed with state emergency officials, revealing a growing number of oil trains are traversing densely populated areas. BNSF Railways reported moving as many as 27 oil trains per week through Chicago's Cook County and 13 a week through Seattle's King County. The shipments have drawn attention since major disasters last year. In Lac Magantic, Canada, 47 people were killed when a runaway train slammed into town. Other derailments in North Dakota and Alabama were significant. U.S. Transportation Secretary Anthony Fox ordered railroads to release information on all trains carrying oil from North Dakota's Bakken to states in an effort to help first responders prepare for an accident. A single train can carry as many as 3 million gallons of fuel, but Fox's order applies to all shipments of 1 million gallons or more. U.S. crude oil shipments by rail topped 100,000 carloads in the first quarter of 2014, according to the Association of American Railroads. That's the highest volume ever moved by rail. And because so much crude is moving by rail, the Bakken boom is causing other transportation issues with grain shipments in the Great Plains. Regulators are now requiring BNSF and Canadian Pacific Railroads to provide weekly updates on their efforts to catch up before the harvest of expected summer crops. The U.S. Surface Transportation Board told the two large rail companies to comply by the end of the week. For their part, rail companies blame a harsh winter and congestion in Chicago for the shortage of rail cars. Those companies also say they have had recent progress in reducing the backup of orders to move grain from the Great Plains. BNSF says they've reduced their backlog from more than 14,000 cars in April to 9,000 just last week. The weekly reports to regulators will be required until BNSF and Canadian Pacific have dealt with the bottlenecks. America's farmers and ranchers are enjoying record or near record prices for their cattle due largely to a drought-reduced herd. While that's not a welcome development for consumers, it presents its own set of challenges for producers. 
And the Agriculture Department estimates that production in America's $85 billion beef industry will decline in 2014 to a 20-year low. Rebuilding, rebuilding the herd will take time, money, and favorable genetics. Market to Market revisited one of the largest seed stock operations in the nation recently and discovered Nichols Farms continues to embrace innovative technologies to produce better beef more efficiently. Laurel Bauer Bergmeier explains. I can't remember a time when we weren't in the cattle business. My mom and dad uh, uh, were married and were tenant farmers in Nebraska and they made a down payment on a farm in Adair County, Iowa when I was a, uh, moved to Adair County when I was a, about a year and a half old. And I always remember dad was a cattle feeder. 20 years ago, Market to Market introduced viewers to Nichols Farms in West Central Iowa. A lot has changed over the past two decades, but one thing hasn't. Dave Nichols of Bridgewater, Iowa still has the wisdom of a cattle feeder and the spirit of an entrepreneur. I think if you were, were to uh, characterize uh, Dave Nichols and Nichols Farms, as my dad once told me, uh, he says, Dave, no more people see if you're a mile ahead of the parade than if you're a mile behind it. And I said, Dad, that's true, but I'm a mile ahead. I get to see the drum majorettes and the band and the flag. If you're a mile behind, you get to see a bunch of old guys picking up horse manure from the local saddle club. Nichols Farms is known internationally for its innovative techniques in using genetic and production data from cattle to produce beef more efficiently. It's a seed stock operation that uh, our core business is a seed stock. And so we, uh, we raise and sell lots of bulls. And uh, we're the, currently the fifth largest seed stock operation in the country that's grown from very uh, very modest beginnings, and uh, uh, my dad's motto, I, I remember my, da my dad has grown wiser every year as I've got older, and his motto was, uh, raise all you can, feed all you raise. What was once a 240-acre farm has now grown into a 5,300-acre family seed stock operation. Nichols attributes his success to rigorous production standards, a willingness to embrace innovations, and aggressive marketing. We're really unique in the large seed stock operations because all of our capital has been earned from within. We don't own Ford dealerships or anything like that. We've had to generate all our capital from within. All Nichols bulls have complete performance records, expected progeny differences, or EPDs, ultrasound data, and DNA profiles. When I scan, what that does is pull that individual bull up in our database. He's already pre-entered in there from winning time by the EID. But it gives us his visual number, his whole pedigree, uh, his birth date, um, all the different data that we keep. We keep about 85 different fields of individual data on, on each individual animal. Today, nearly 85% of all U.S. Simmental genetics are traced to Nichols bulls. And all bulls in the top 1% of the all-purpose index, or API, contain Nichols genetics. Dave credits that track record to a commitment to keep the commercial producer and cattle feeder as a top priority. We're known as our bulls are raised under the same environments that, uh, that, that their cattle are. We don't show cattle, we don't fit cattle, we don't clip heads, we don't trim feet. Uh, we expect our cattle to work just as hard as we and our employees do. And uh, so our cattle are known as, these cattle are also known as cattle that have a lot of performance and grow. In 2013, Nichols Farms sold over 400 bulls and is on track to do the same this year, including farmer Nick Price of Earlham, Iowa. What brings me to Nichols now, I believe, is I was looking for consistency in genetics and uh, like a solid cow herd that provides those genetics along with the sires that they put on the cows. Nichols Farms procedures include artificial insemination of approximately 80% of purebred cows and heifers one time with seed stock from high accuracy sires. The remaining wet two-year-olds are bred naturally. To shorten generation interval and make maximum progress, Nichols Farms cleans up with a large number of yearling sires. 
except for the two-year-olds, which are bred with a combination of proven and yearling bulls. Nichols sires are determined by an in-house index emphasizing carcass merit per day of age. As for females, all open heifers and cows are culled after a 63-day breeding season. Dry cows never go to pasture, and all females that lose a calf for any reason are culled from the herd. Other culling criteria include soundness of feet, legs, and udders, as well as disposition and performance. Nichols Farms computerized its system as soon as the technology became available. Today, its database contains more than 70 fields of data on each animal. To meet its production protocols, Nichols Farms embraces virtually every technology available, including ultrasound and genomics, and the operation has participated in over 20 research projects with land-grant universities. He's a leader in adapting new things, and the techniques and the technology that I see them do are really creative and on, on the cutting edge and the forefront. And I think we're, we're lucky to have such uh, an innovator in Iowa representing the beef industry and see how he impacts the, the industry throughout the nation. With a cattle feeder's perspective and a commitment to better beef that benefits not just Nichols Farms but the whole industry, Dave has had a deep-seated conviction to scientifically identify superior carcass genetics. And I think what, what Nichols Farms offers to the consumer is a, a higher quality beef, a leaner product, but still with the marbling that we want for taste. And they also offer consistency, so that when I go to the grocery store or I go to the restaurant and I order a steak, I get a great taste, tasting steak every time I order it. So you add that consistency. And I think that's what Nichols Farm is all about. Nichols Farm's genetics extend well beyond the United States. They've exported live cattle, embryos, and semen to 30 countries. And after 50 years in the cattle business, Dave has no intention of slowing down. The reason we expand is, is part of my DNA, and I can't help it. <laughs> part of the reason, though, the main reason is, is if you really want to make improvement when you're improving, um, improving cattle or hogs or anything, it requires numbers. And if, uh, in, in our case here, just... Just in our Iowa division here, we have 600 bulls born each year, and we are going to pick out the, the 10 of them that's best. If we had 100 cows, we wouldn't have that many to pick up, pick out of. And so if you want your son uh, to be a uh, road scholar that makes it into the NFL, you probably better find out a way to have a thousand kids. Next, the market to market report. It was another wild week in livestock where prices soared into record territory yet again. Grain prices, on the other hand, traded sideways. For the week, September wheat gained half a penny, while the nearby corn contract moved six cents lower. Old crop soybeans rallied modestly as the July contract settled with a weekly gain of 17 cents. Nearby meal prices followed suit with an upward move of $7.55 per ton. In the softs, cotton lost all of last week's gain and then some as the December contract gave up $2.23 per hundredweight. In the dairy market, July Class 3 milk lost 23 cents while the deferred contract gave up 25. But the big story again this week was in the livestock sector, where with prices already in record territory, the August cattle contract gained $4.80. August feeders advanced by a whopping $7.45, and the July lean hog contract improved by $0.67. Cents. In the financials, the euro gained five basis points against the dollar. Crude oil declined by more than a dollar per barrel. Comex gold advanced by $3.40 per ounce, and the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index lost more than five points to settle at $6.63.50. Here now to lend us his insight on these and other trends is one of our regular market analysts, Alan Brugler. Alan, welcome back. Always good to be here with you, Mike. Well, and we're excited to have you here. We've got a lot to discuss. And if we start the week off here in the grain markets, taking a look at this at this wheat picture, we've got harvest going on. How do, the, how do yields look so far? 
Well, they're, they're all over the board. You've got a lot of poor wheat because of the earlier drought, uh, some freeze damage in some places, uh, hail damage as you usually would expect on occasion. But we've also had some 100 bushel field reports, uh, so it's not all bad. But uh, bottom line is winter wheat crop's going to be small, and we knew that. Spring wheat is, of course, still developing. And now your thoughts on the spring wheat as we look at Monday's, uh, Monday's report. What, what is the trade expecting? The trade's looking for acreage to be just a little bit smaller than the March intentions. I think the average estimate is about 72,000 acres smaller. Uh, we think that's too, too conservative, that the, the real number is probably more like 150,000 below the March intentions. But uh, you know, clearly there was some wheat that didn't get planted due to wet weather and probably switched to soybeans. As we take a look at, on, at Monday's report, if the acreage number is lower, how much smaller is the number, does the number need to be to get some bullish movement in these wheat markets? Well, it's difficult to move the, the wheat market because the global numbers are so big. Uh, the International Grains Council raised their estimate again for global numbers this week. Uh, U.S. stocks are the tightest since, since 07, but that doesn't help us if, if we're the residual supplier and everybody else, like the Russians and the Ukrainians, is undercutting us. So. You know, we can find support in here to, from the technical standpoint. Uh, a little, you know, 200,000 less acres would probably help us a little bit. The, the Canadians helped us with Stats Can report today that said that the Canadian wheat acreage was down a little bit from the earlier intentions. Uh, but uh, to make a stand, we really need some help from, from the feed grain sector, from corn. Any, any advice for producers here who are working their way through harvest or or looking at their spring plantings? Well, we've basically pre-sold about 60% of the crop uh, for harvest delivery or, or thereabouts, and uh, we've got some hedges in place on the rest, and we're not ready to lift those at this point. Okay. Well, now let's take a look at the corn market. You, you mentioned that we're going to need corn to pull some weight in order to get wheat to move higher. We didn't see it happen this week. We saw the, uh, the, the old crop slide a little bit and uh, a new crop down a little bit as well. Where is this market headed on Monday? What are the trade expectations for corn acreage? Well, the trade's looking for the corn acreage to be, again, fairly close to the March intentions. You've got you know, two com competing camps there. You've got the folks that think it was it was too wet up north, and we switched some acres to beans. And then you've got the folks saying, yes, but the weather was perfect in three I states in Ohio and during early May, and the planters probably ran a little extra long. And uh, there were some acres that weren't accounted for in the March intentions that were planted last year that may have ended up in corn. So net-net, uh, you end up with the number 91.6 to 91.8 million acres, and that's not far from the March intentions. Uh, I'm not going to make a bet on which, which way we want to deviate from that number. Uh, if, it's, if it's that large, if it's 91 and a half or bigger, then, then we've still got a compelling argument for a record U.S. crop. Uh, there are some surveys floating around that suggest it might be 89 and a half or 90 million. If that's accurate, I think the market's probably too cheap right now. We're down on chart support, and there's a good opportunity for a bounce. Okay. Now, we, we do have some, some questions, and actually this has been a question all over the Corn Belt here in these last two weeks. Justin in Rock Rapids uh, sent us a, a Twitter comment. He's been riding around this week, and he says there's a lot of rain, and it looks like a lot of fields still need tile. So the question is, after all of these heavy rains we've seen throughout the Corn Belt, the market's not offering any more support. Are we still anticipating here that rain is making grain? I think that's exactly the case. The, the, you can't have a drought if it keeps raining, and the market's been conditioned over the last few years to respond to drought concerns more than flooding. And, and the flooding is very localized. It's not like 2011 where you had the entire Missouri River Valley underwater. So uh, you do have some possible negatives here. You, you've got fairly shallow root development because there's been regular to heavy rains. That's, that's a risk next fall. Uh, that's, you've also got, if this cool and wet pattern continues, there's also the risk of an early freeze or some other issue then. But in the short run, uh, we're going to assume that corn likes cool and wet temperatures and, and yields are going to be pretty good most places. So advice to producers here looking at their fields of that new crop corn, do you go ahead and make some sales at this level knowing that 91.6 million acres or change could be 
in the ground? Well, we are against some tactical support. We're near the, the January lows and the new crop. Uh, we're up against that seven-year uptrend line on the old crop corn, uh, just within a few cents of it. Uh, those levels held us in January after the January stocks report, so we want to want to see what the numbers say first to see if, the, if there's a compelling reason to sell it now versus, say, a month from now. Uh, we, on the other hand, we believe you need to have some put coverage in place going into the report, either, either December puts or the, the serial puts that expire just a couple weeks after the report that are a little cheaper to buy. Sure, they're short-term, short-dated options. Right. You bet. All right, so things to think about as that report comes out at 11 o'clock on Monday, correct? Correct. All right, don't rush into the elevator first thing Monday morning wait and see some numbers. That's our opinion. All right. Now, as we take a look over at the soybean market, we did see a bit of a bounce. Old crop soybeans up 16 cents. What was driving that this week? We had stronger than expected old crop export sales, uh, over 317,000 tons of old crop sales. The, 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 we're sitting here saying we shouldn't have any beans left to sell, but we keep selling them. And why isn't Argentina and Brazil getting this business when they've clearly got some inventory? Uh, the world still wants U.S. beans. So the, we had to have a rally because we don't think we have the beans. Uh, that's what the, the Monday report's going to have to tell us is, do we, have we had enough imports already to, to grease the wheel, so to speak, or are we miscounted a little bit on old crop production, that there's more beans there, or in fact, are we selling stuff we don't have, in which case we're going back to $15 fairly quickly here. Okay. Now, as you mentioned, uh, we got this report on Monday. Where, where do we anticipate new crop bean acres coming in at? Uh, bean acres, probably around 82 million, uh, give or take a few. The, again, there's the idea is there's been some switching in the northern plains to some more beans. Uh, the wild card there is double crop beans. We, we are a little behind on wheat, winter wheat harvest, which is where most of the double crop comes from. Uh, so you can't maybe count all the double crop, and we're not sure what USDA was picking up from the producer on June 1 as far as double crop. Okay, now as we take a look at new crop bean pricing, 1234 as we close the market on Friday, knowing that there could be 82 million acres out there, do you go ahead and make some sales? I, I'm not comfortable selling it right here. Uh, again, we've got some 1240 puts just in case, but we are in an uptrend. Uh, there's a regression channel on the charts that the the, the, the the speculative funds have been buying the dips to that channel. That's a 1220. And, uh, you know, realistically, no beans are very cheap compared to old crop. If we're, if we're making export sales beans we don't have at $14, What's the argument for, for no beans at $12 to go down until you know you've got a, a real surplus? All right. Things to keep an eye out for. Now let's jump over to the livestock sector where there has been a lot of excitement this past week. Uh, we saw the, the fat cattle market futures touch uh, closed at 151.12 on Friday. Cash cattle market still 2 $3 higher than that. Where is this headed? Well, we had a very strong cash cattle market on Friday, as you mentioned, 154 to 155 in the south, a 4 to $5 jump from last week. It's being supported by the, by the beef, by the cutouts, and, uh, and a, frankly, a shortage of, of ready cattle. Uh, basically, there's only two ways this thing ends. Either the consumer quits buying the beef and the packer can't pay and it, what he's paying now, or uh, you get competing supplies, okay? In other words, you could have an economic argument you know, income don't support it, or you can have a chicken and pork expand enough that beef doesn't have to be this high. But for right now, we don't really see the end. It's a, it's an upward spiral, and it's going to end ugly when it ends. But uh, uh, and I, I worry that we're getting close to the end because cattlemen are getting a little too complacent about it. Oh yeah, it's up again this week. You know, uh, when everybody gets comfortable with it, it's usually when it's just about over. All right, speaking of that upturn spiral, as we take a look at the feeder cattle market, again, huge week, $7, $7 on the board. Uh, auction trade has been hot all week. Do we see this feeder cattle market continuing its upward spiral? Well, again, it's in, a, it's in a, uh, a realizing bull market. You have anticipatory bull markets. We had that six months ago, knowing we were, had a problem coming. Now we know we're in the problem. We can't get the cattle that we want. The live price being as high as it is, is allowing the feedlots to chase what few feeders are out there. And then, of course, uh, we're pulling back heifers out of the feeder mix in order to try to rebuild the herd now that we've got better pasture conditions. Does the market have an idea of how many heifers we are retaining? 
uh, we've got a rough idea if you look at the at the placement data, and uh, of course we'll get a USDA cattle inventory report here in July. Okay. Now, as we take a look at the hog market, we did have the uh, hogs and pigs report out today. Could you walk us through those numbers a little bit? Yeah, they, they found a few less than the trade was looking for as far as the published estimates. The trade was looking for a little over 97% of year ago for uh, all hogs, and the actual number was 95%. Uh, the market hog numbers were also down approximately 5%. Uh, and the breeding herd, the sow herd, was expected to be higher, 101 or so, was actually only 99% and change. So all in all, fewer hogs than what the trade had stated it was looking for going into the report. Now, I want to be a little careful with this because the futures are carrying a fairly substantial premium to the cash hog market already, anticipating this type of uh, scenario. Uh, so it's possible we only get a dollar or two bounce out of this thing and then a uh, dollar or two on the board on the board and but the cash should start to reflect the, the tighter scenario that we just saw now the breeding herd number being down a percent or two after six months of these record prices in the hog market is that pretty surprising or was that something that uh, that you were anticipating well no it's it's surprising it, it, in that we assumed that because there's not, we don't have the mortality in the sows. The assumption was, with you know feeder pig prices in the 70s, we ought to be trying to get more pigs. Uh, but I think what's probably happened. I haven't, did not have an opportunity to really go through the numbers, but I suspect that uh, we've had some depopulation efforts in order to control the virus and that the surveys picked up some of that. All right. Well, Alan, we appreciate your thoughts on the markets tonight. You're welcome. That wraps up this edition of Market to Market. But Alan and I will continue our discussion and answer some of your questions in our Market Plus segment online. You'll also find audio podcasts and streaming video of our program, as well as links to our Twitter feed, Facebook page, and the rest of our social media outlets exclusively at the Market to Market website. And be sure to join us next week when we'll learn how one entrepreneur is combining land and lake in hopes of catching a profit. Until then, thanks for watching. I'm Mike Pearson. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa Public Television, which is solely responsible for its content. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com. And by Sookup Manufacturing Company. Offering a full line of grain drying and storage equipment and steel buildings, Sookup Manufacturing is on a mission to protect and preserve your crop and the tools that produce it. <laughs>